Great. Beautiful pictures cut up into tiny little pieces that we've got to put together. Mr. Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters and guests. So over the last couple of weeks, I've been doing jigsaws on a Friday night with my little girls. They're seven and eight. They love doing the ones with the little kittens in there and the flowers and it all. We've developed our <coughs> own way of doing it. Alice, my eight-year-old, she came up with it. She said, Dad, grab the box, you turn it upside down, give it a good shake, and then lift the underside out. Then we go through and we sort it out. We, we put the bits that are in the middle of the jigsaw go on the underside, and the frame goes on the table. Pretty common way of doing jigsaws, is it? Yeah. Then we start putting it together. We have the reference points of the corners. We've got four corners, and then we build the frame out. Then the fun part starts, where you can have the speed with your picture. We start on the kit and we do the eyes, the whiskers onto the flowers. Then it's to the hard part, the sky. <laughs> it's 50 shades of blue. You have to work out how these pieces fit together. And often, it's not that easy to work out. So Alice said, Dad, what we do, we take the piece that's already in the jigsaw, we grab the one that we think it goes next to it, and we sit it on top. And then all we have to do, Daddy, is slide it off. Now, if it's the right piece, when you slide it off, it goes click. How cool is that? You can know you've got the right piece in the right place without even looking. It just feels right. And then she added, but Daddy, when you slide it off, if it's the wrong piece, it goes clunk. <laughs> that is a great metaphor for life, isn't it? When we're kids, our school, our family, our friends give us the frame that we work in. And as we're growing up, teenagers, early adults, we get to have the fun parts of the kitten and the flowers and all that stuff. And then as adults, we have to do the tough parts the, about making decisions. What are we going to do? It's about priorities. What priorities make us happy? How do we know what makes us happy? How do we know what our priority should be? I think we've got to be a bit selfish to work that out. It's all about putting yourself first. Because our priorities in life determine what we do and what we put in place in our life. And that makes us happy. And I don't know whether or not you've looked around the world at the moment, but there's a lot of unhappy people. If you look at the chronic mental health issues we've got in this country, the escalating suicide rates and the record sales of depression, um, antidepressants, it's huge. There's a big problem we've got to counter. And it's not just adults. It's kids as well. There are kids in this city who are given Prozac to make it through the day. When we're in a world where we've got to give a seven-year-old a tablet to make them happy, we've got something wrong. Somebody's got their priorities wrong. I've been unhappy. I've been on that slippery slope that can end in depression. It was 2009, I was working for the Australian Bureau of Statistics. I used to count the number of people who went to libraries, art galleries and museums. It's impressive, I know, <laughs> but it's not that exciting. <laughs> to do well at the Bureau of Statistics, you had to enjoy statistics, have an eye for detail and love wearing a cardigan. That just wasn't me. Every day that I went to work, a little piece inside of me died. The dreams that I had for life were slipping away. I developed that attitude of being a bit negative. Everyone's out to get me. I know the best way to do this. I don't care if you're the boss. I'm going to do it my way. I had my priorities all wrong. But I knew it was me that had the issue because we all worked in the same environment. I looked at some of my colleagues. <coughs> They'd been there for 30 years, career public servants. They'd been doing the same work for 30 years and they loved it. There were people who'd been there for extended periods of time and really enjoyed their job and there was others <coughs> like me who could no longer bear to seasonally adjust. I'd reached a point where <coughs> I'd started clunking because it wasn't always that way. When I started at the ABS, I loved it. 
I loved going to work. I was happy to go to work. I was happy to see my spreadsheets and they were happy to see me. I clicked being a public servant. I clicked going to meetings and I clicked going home on time. But over time, life changed. I had a kid, a mortgage and lost all my hair. I turned around and my surrounds, I had grown and my surrounds hadn't changed. My life had progressed. What used to make me click had started to clump. It doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen. You, if you haven't yet, at one time in your life, you will wake up and realise that life no longer clicks. Where there was once a click, there's clunk. Where there was joy, there becomes apathy. Where there was lust, there's... Not tonight, dear. It doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen. It creeps up on you, and one day you wake up wearing a cardigan. <laughs> Clunking is not wrong. It's not bad. It's a sign that life has progressed. And it's time for us to change to meet our new life. Now, it may scare you. It may excite you or somewhere in between. But I guarantee you, if you don't change, nothing will. The jigsaw of life is about working out what priorities go in what order. Every now and then I sit down with my kids and we play with the kittens, we do the flowers and we work out what is fun. And when we do that, we become happier and life starts to click. Thank you very much, Darren. That was an excellent speech. For those of you who are going to the contest this weekend, that's the sort of speeches you're going to hear right the way through the day. So make sure you can get there if you can. We will be doing an evaluation for Darren later, but I would like to suggest that if any of you have any comments to make to Darren, I'm sure he would certainly take them on board. Absolutely. Yep. Because it doesn't matter who gives the actual evaluation, if you have some other ideas you can think of some way of supporting or critiquing <coughs> a particular speech, then certainly speak to the speaker and let them know how you feel. They can either take it on or not take it on, it's totally up to them. But I recommend that you do so. Speaker number two for this evening is Dennis Jocelyn. <laughs> the lights. But anyway, for speaker number two is Michael Landry. Could you let me know the, um, the things for objectives? Objectives. objectives. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, colleague. The objectives for persuade the followers. <coughs> and the objectives? Um, yes, persuade the followers. So, adapt your viewpoint ideas to take some action to appeal to the audience's interest. But basically, it's persuade the followers. Thank you, Michael. For the speech entitled... <laughs> I've given up. <laughs> Never give up. Dennis Jocelyn. Never, ever give up. Never, ever. <laughs> 